we're doing an Ask Me Anything on the Epic Homesteading channel. Kevin here. I figured in the interim of working on some projects and trying to get some new videos out for you guys, I'd just answer whatever questions that you had. So I threw a post up on my community page and you all delivered a lot of questions. I'm gonna fire through as many as I possibly can, but there's no way I can answer all of them. So if I didn't answer yours, I'm sorry, but cultivate that like button anyways, and I'll get you next time. Let's get into it. Okay, the first question from Too Little Hero 2. What kind of fertilizers do you use? Do you use a kind that has everything the plants need, like a 488, or do you use straight bone meal, straight feather meal? Honestly, both. It really depends. Like, for example, with the indoor house plants, I'll just use an all purpose fertilizer. Not too picky about that, but let's say early on in a life of a corn plant, I'll use something like feather meal, high nitrogen. I want to put a lot of a specific macronutrient in there. So that's the answer to that one. Aaron Martinez. What is trench composting? I have a tiny yard. Trench composting is basically just digging a trench and burying directly into the soil. It works perfectly fine, especially if your soil life is relatively healthy and a lot of microbes can get in there and start to break it down. So it's a hybrid between like a Bokashi style composting and the traditional passive composting. So it works really well. That's what a lot of cultures have done for hundreds or even thousands of years burying fish heads, things like that. Next question is, how did you first get into gardening and what is your favorite hobby outside of gardening? Well, my favorite hobby outside of gardening, at least before 2020, was rock climbing. I used to go to the rock climbing gym all the time. I've since fallen off that because I kind of have a hand injury that I'm working on and it's not the best sport to do if you're kind of a heavy person and you have a hand injury because you're putting so much stress on those tendons. So I don't do that anymore, but honestly, I don't really have any other hobbies right now because this property is just giving me so much to work on. All my hobbies can almost be contained within this property, which I don't know if that's good or bad. How did I first get into gardening? I might actually do a whole separate video on that, but in short, didn't know what to do with my life at maybe 22, 23 or so, and was playing tons and tons of video games. I had played poker to support myself through college, and just neither of those were fulfilling, so I wanted to do something outdoors with my brother. We ended up gardening together, and from then on, I've been hooked, but there's a lot more to that story. Okay, Adam Steinauer, are you considering adding a chicken coop to the homestead? For sure I am, and it's all gonna be covered here on the channel. Aiken for bacon. <laughs> what kind of fertilizer, fertilizer brands do you recommend for deficient soils? I mean, one of the things that's gonna help, it's in which way is that soil deficient? So a soil test is gonna help you out a lot there. And from there, it's hard to go wrong with well-balanced compost. It's hard to go wrong with well-aged manure. Uh, if you have other more specific issues, then it gets into a little bit more of a detailed answer. Andrea. I'm in coastal San Diego and stingy with water unless it's edible, it better be drought tolerant. How do I deal with drought conditions, irrigation, and the premium cost of water? It's a great question. It's something I'm really trying to figure out right now because I'm actually scared to see what my water bill will be because when we filmed the show here, we were using lots of water and the hose was not really set up yet, so you had to run out the hot water on the hose, which basically meant you were dumping that water, didn't have a basin to put it in. So we'll see. I've got a lot planned for that. Uh, hopefully some rainwater capture. There's also some devices that you can use in hot climates that pull water out of the air and actually sort of just distill it for you. So we can take a look at that. Uh, okay, be a Bruja. What got you to start filming videos? Any tips on starting a YouTube channel? So what, wow, why did I start doing that YouTube channel? <laughs> I don't even know. I, I think I just wanted something to do uh, and I wanted to share. I like to share what I learned so it's hopefully helpful to other people. I like to see what people do with what I put out there. That's kind of like the biggest value that I get from putting out my videos. And so way back then, you know, I thought I was doing a lot of hydroponics and I didn't think there was the best information out there about hydroponics. So as I was learning it, I was sharing what I learned. And that's what really got me to, to get started. I would say if someone wants to start a YouTube channel, one of the best things you can do is always focus on giving as much value to the people watching as humanly possible. That's the goal. You know, what's the real, what's, what, what makes a channel grow? What makes a channel grow is giving people what they want when they go to the channel, so much so that they can't help but tell their friends about it, right? That's really what makes it grow. And so whether that's entertainment, style, makeup, gardening, anything, you have to focus on what they want. I think a lot of people make videos about what they want, as in me. I do make videos I enjoy, obviously, but I try to make a video that I think you will enjoy, even if it might not be something that you know, in a perfect world in some sort of artistic fantasy, that's the video I would make. I make it for you guys. Okay, I'm just now getting started gardening and I'm pretty overwhelmed. What is the best thing to start out with? This is from Cameron Hill. Um, if you're just getting started now, which would be fall when this video comes out, I would say your leafy greens, uh, anything in the brassica family, your kale, 
your broccoli, your cauliflower, those are a little bit tr more tricky, but root crops are actually great in fall. So like beets, carrots, uh, radish, try any of those. Whichever one you like the most, I would try that. Daniel Waters, how do you track what you're growing and when it's due to harvest, also success and failure? So I have a garden notebook that's digital that I use in a tool called Notion. And so I capture all of my garden data there. The rest of it is in a spreadsheet that I'm actually developing. So if you guys want access to that spreadsheet, let me know in the comments and I will actually be probably selling it for like maybe 10 or 20 bucks or something like that. It's gonna be pretty robust. So you should be able to put in your gardening zone. It'll calculate every common crop, the days to maturity, all the timing, all the succession planting, everything like that. All right, Chef Grace's Place. Hope you're building a bed in that garage and not the raised bed kind either. <laughs> Can't wait for MTV Cribs Epic Homestead Edition. Yeah, maybe once this place is actually filled out, I'll do a full tour. Sierra Dye. Kevin, what kind of strategies do you use to keep organized as far as garden and homestead related tasks that need to be done? Uh, I have a task planner, again, that I use in Notion. It's just a digital tool. It's free for personal use and it's really robust. So <clears throat> it's very flexible. That's the thing. So you can make it anything you want. You can make it a project manager, a to-do list, a journal, a note-taking app. And so for that reason, it's a little weird to use, but if you get used to it, I use that. But really any task management system, even if it's just pen and paper, you have to make sure, especially with homestead stuff and gardening stuff, you're doing those recurring tasks. If you don't do those recurring tasks, you're gonna get way too far behind and you won't be able to keep up. Denise B, how should I clean up the garden and prep in winter in zone six? So generally speaking, I think in a past life, earlier in my gardening career, I would say you'd clear out all your debris, throw it in the compost, etc. These days, actually, unless you have some serious diseased debris, then I would actually leave it on top of the beds. I might even grow like a winter kill cover crop and let it die on top of the beds. If not that, then I would add some compost to the top of the beds. You want that soil protected so that it actually starts to condition itself and break down over the course of winter so that when spring comes, you can actually start gardening and your soil is nice and improved rather than doing the improvement in the end of winter. From Elijah Wu, Elijah, what's up? Best way to convince someone to start a garden. That's actually a good question. I mean, I think nothing is ever decided by me to make you do something. You have to decide it for yourself, right? Like if you're talking to a friend and you want to convince them to, I don't know, like stop eating so much bad food, you don't just say, hey, stop eating so much bad food. You have to make them make that decision for themselves. And so all I try to do on Epic Gardening, Epic Homesteading, is I just share what I'm doing and I try to make it fun, enjoyable, accessible, and then I just let people convince themselves that it's something they want to do. I really don't try to convince anyone that they should try to garden. You know, it's up to them to make that choice and then I'm there to help them if possible. And a beetle just landed on my back. All right, Eliska Charlotte W. How old am I? 33. Did I go to college or university? Yes, I did. I went to University of California, Santa Barbara, and I studied business economics with an accounting emphasis, but I actually played online poker throughout college that ended up paying for school for me. So I got pretty good at it, I would say. Uh, not as good as some of my friends, but you know, decent enough to pay for school with it and do a little traveling after school. And that's kind of how my, um, that's kind of how my origin story came, is I was gonna be an accountant, and then as I was playing poker in college, I was like, you know what? I'm seeing all my friends suffering, working 80, 90, 100 hour weeks. Some of them slept under their desk and they're making less money than I was making playing poker. Not to say that poker's the best career path of all time, but I certainly knew that I would do that over being an accountant working 100 hours a week. And so that put me on a different life path. And then from there, kind of fumbled around on tons of different business ideas until I came across uh, Epic Gardening and, and went full time on Epic Gardening. But if you guys wanna see more of an origin story type of video, I'm happy to do that. Okay, lots of questions here. I'll answer some of those other questions later on. E Ermud 10 will you do another survival challenge in the future since you've gotten some experience and now have a bigger garden? Uh, yeah, I think actually next summer I will try to do um, maybe two weeks to a month or so, probably two weeks minimum of a survival challenge. I mean, here, if I can't survive at this property in, uh, for two weeks or a month, then I'm a total failure. So with chickens, being able to fish, having all the fruit trees, hopefully producing a little bit by then, growing tons of potatoes and, and more calorie dense crops, and I should be good to go. Oh, this is an interesting one. Esteban Martinez, if when you die, you could become any tree or plant, what would I choose? So this is really kind of stupid. I told my brother, uh, I said, okay, you're gonna be in my will. And when I die, cause you can like put all these like contingencies in your will. I said, I'm gonna turn myself, you, to get all my money, what you have to do is you have to plant a citrus tree 
and then graft 10 different varieties onto that tree. You have to bury me under the tree so I can fertilize the tree, so I'm becoming the tree. And then you have to eat of the 10 fruits. Otherwise, the executor of the will won't give you the money. So it's like 10 years of work to get all the money. And he was like, I'm down. So I, I guess I would become a multi-grafted citrus tree for my life if I died. Giant battle robot. How much time are you spending tending your garden every day or every week, excluding new setups, major work? How would I design a garden for max production, minimal time cost? What would be my priorities? Uh, and do you not get slugs or snails? I really don't get slugs or snails. We have other, more, more of our pests are either rodents or flying pests like a cabbage moth. But to answer this question, uh, per day or per week, per day at least 15 minutes a day, 15-ish or so. Um, per week, the bigger tasks like watering, 30 minutes. Uh, it really depends. Like if I'm planting seedlings out, that's like an hour or two. If I'm, you know, I would say on average, maybe five hours a week or so, just depends. Like as I scale up here, it's going to be a lot more. But when you have a system really nicely rolling, you really don't spend a lot of time gardening. You're in the garden and enjoying it, but you're not really spending a ton of time on the garden, which is kind of nice. I mean, like I said, these, these plants grow themselves. You don't really grow them. Uh, you just put an environment together in which they grow. And so how would I design a garden for max production and minimal time cost? I would say um, pick the things that you know you like to eat. And if you really wanted them to not take a lot of time, then pick the easiest crops to grow, the least maintenance crops. So maybe potatoes would be a great one. You know, if you really like potatoes, potatoes, beans, these are easy to grow and they don't take a lot of time. It's just simple. So that's what I would say. I, I can do a lot more on that in the future though. Ooh, Gwendy Rose, what kind of music do you listen to and what are your, some of your favorite artists? What animals do you like? <laughs> What's the meaning of life? <laughs> Interesting. Okay, um, well, music, it's tricky. I used to listen to a lot of like 90s rap, 90s alt rock, all the 90s pop music I loved a lot, like Bare Naked Ladies and stuff like that. Um, but these days I listen to a lot of lo-fi, chill, hip-hop style music on YouTube because if I'm working, I can't have lyrics. I can't focus if there's lyrics. If not, if I'm like out in the garden, I'm probably actually rocking like a podcast instead or an audiobook instead of music. And I think I could probably like bump up my music ratio a little bit, have a little more enjoyment, but I'm always trying to learn stuff. And so I'm always syncing up like a podcast or, a, or an audiobook. Uh, some of my favorite artists in the past, Red Hot Chili Peppers, obsessed with them. Saves the Day, used to be obsessed with them. Um, Souls of Mischief, Hieroglyphics back in the day. Uh, man, so many. I mean, honestly, so many. There's very few genres of music I don't like. What animals do I like? My favorite animal is probably a frog. I love frogs. And what's the meaning of life? This is actually kind of an interesting one. I actually don't think there is an objective meaning to life. I don't think you could say that it's one thing for all people. I think you choose your own meaning of life. You choose a meaning that, that you find powerful and then you go after that. Uh, and if that meaning doesn't line up with someone else's meaning, that's fine. That's kind of the purpose. So, you know, we can't prove that there's any meaning to life. And I kind of operate on the idea of is it observable? Can you in some way make a claim that it's real? There's no way to make a claim that there's some objective meaning of life. And so just choose what you want your life to be about, make it about that and go for it. Iva Chung, why did your first hydroponic cucumbers taste bad? I did not manage the nutrients on that. So it wasn't getting the nutrition it needed to taste good and I harvested them too late. So you combine both of those and you have some really disgusting cucumbers. Ivory Hernandez, how can you start gardening when living in an apartment? I have a patio that isn't too big, but it's not too small. I would love to grow vegetables. So yeah, apartment gardening is, it's limited, right? I mean, depending on where that patio faces, you only have so much space, you gotta grow in containers. So I would say, if you really have small space, I would look at my microgreens playlist on Epic Gardening. There's tons of videos on how to do that, which is actually quite a bit of food. You can produce a lot of food in a small space there. But otherwise, utilize your balcony railings, use trailing plants, you can go cucumbers, tomatoes, etc. Go for varieties that are bushing style. So a little bush cucumber, bush tomato. You want to do space efficient things that put out a lot of fruit on a small footprint of a plant is what I would say. James Reichelt, how do I find what growing zone I'm in? Good question, common question. I mean, all you do is you go to type in Google, USDA hardiness zone calculator, then you type in your zip code and it'll spit out your hardiness zone for you. Janine Lofton, hey Kevin, what is your favorite cookie? Oatmeal chocolate chip. And if you don't like that, unsubscribe. <laughs> your favorite house plant, mm, probably Cebu Blue Pothos, I would say. Um, and mine died, so I need another one. So I'm pretty sad about that. My favorite drink, boba. I love boba. One last question, is there anything that I hate to do or eat? I don't like driving. Um, 
and I don't, wow, what do I hate to eat? I don't think I hate to eat anything and that's like a problem in my life. I eat way too much stuff. Jello 1000, what are your fall crops? Did I restart my garlic? My garlic's gonna get started in November this year and my fall crops this year are gonna be a lot of brassicas. So your, your um, cauliflowers, your broccoli, your collards, your kales, and a lot of different root crops. And also I'm gonna go for a fall crop of potatoes as well. Jennifer Herr, how do I not get demotivated when I lose half of my harvest to pests and heat? Yeah, I mean, that's really depressing. I think this year it's happened to a lot of people because of the heat waves we've been dealing with. So I would just say, find something that excites you to start growing again, to like refresh yourself, right? So if you lose the harvest and you spent a lot of time on it, you lost it and it's really depressing and sad, you know, pick something that may, might be a little easier or even just really kind of seems fun, even if it's not super productive, like grow some flowers, you know? Just do something that gets you excited again. John Webster, what plant in your garden gets you the most excited when you see it growing? Mine at the moment is potatoes. Well, my loofah is the one that gets me the most excited because it's my first year actually growing the loofah gourd successfully, and I have one on the vine, and so I'm super excited about that. I can dry it, and I can take the sponge, and I can actually uh, have a little shower scrub, so I'm excited about the loofah. Jose Zarate Ventura, what was the process like to find a suitable homestead? What, was I looking for size, location? What did I prioritize? Actually, a really good question. So I had been looking for houses for four or five months, I would say, before I found this one. And honestly, when I came down, when it came up on the MLS, I drove down the same day and I looked at it. I'd looked at maybe 10 houses, I think, before that. As soon as I saw the lot, I was like, that's the one, I'm gonna have it, I'm gonna buy it no matter what. And that's what happened. So why did I say that? That's the question, right? Well, first of all, I saw producing fruit trees. I saw a small house, about a thousand square feet in a corner of the lot on a over a quarter acre. So I have uh, basically 0.3 acres here of untouched space. There's nothing weird about it. There's no, no crazy slopes. Uh, it's all sun accessible. You know, it needs some love. Uh, the house actually, since this is urban, right? So I'm only still two, three miles from the coast here in San Diego, it's urban. And so what I thought is, you know what? The property value is probably gonna go up. So I thought about it from that perspective as well. I thought, you know, if I'm in the coast, the coastal breeze is still coming through. That's really nice. So I'm not gonna get blasted by the heat. I'm not like way inland in the desert. Uh, and then the final thing I thought of was, this house is actually one of the least improved homes on the block. And so I said, you know, if I put in some work here, improving the landscaping, improving the building, et cetera. I've got like a nice property on my hands. And honestly, there's so much space for an urban homestead that it's just completely untapped. And so that's kind of, that was kind of my metrics there. It's not this typical homesteading considerations, but uh, this is an urban homestead. And I, in my mind, I'm kind of redefining what I think homesteading is for me. Catherine Edgar, I've got an avocado seed that's been sitting in water, has a nice long root about four inches. When can I plant it into soil? I mean, avocado trees, don't grow in water and so you can plant it in soil from the start if you want to so there's not actually not a good answer there you could you could have done that from the very start uh, you don't have to root it in water you can just root it in soil Kelsey Omara direct seeding versus transplants how to successfully transplant things that people say not to transplant like squash cucumbers melons um, yeah most things that people say you can't transplant I've noticed that in fact you can now does that mean that you should not necessarily like what you're talking about here is squash cucumbers melons corn and pumpkins I typically would still direct sow those if I had the opportunity to. If you don't, then of course don't do it. How do you how do you actually transplant them? I mean, really, it's the same method as transplanting anything else. You just want to make sure that, especially like things like squash, cucumbers, melons, they are very susceptible to not establishing well after you transplant them. So you want to make sure they're well watered. Throw some mulch on top. Protect them while they actually reset up their root system to work in that new soil. Kelly Dawson. We live in South Carolina, just took out 15 pine trees. How do you determine how big a garden should be? Um, it's basically like how much do you want that garden to provide for you? Are you trying to go 100% of food for your family? Or are you trying to get just like a nice flower garden or a nice kitchen garden? That'll determine the sizing. There's a bunch of charts you can find online for how much garden for a person, depending on the crops you like to grow. So it's actually kind of a complicated answer. But in general, I think like two raised beds per person would be a good place to start. And then from there, you can kind of figure it out. Kimberly D. Love what you're doing. Thanks, Kimberly. Since you don't have to worry about freezing temps, what are tips for finding plants to grow for other conditions? Yeah, native plants are gonna do really well in zones nine and 10, because there's just so many that we can grow that a lot of people cannot grow. Another thing you have to consider about 
um, for zones 9 and 10, like you're saying. She says, I find zones useless for 9 and 10. They're not useless, it's just that they don't gate off the season as much as other zones would. You know, in zone 6, you have a very defined start and end to the season on average, whereas here in zone 10, we don't have a frost date. And so it, people get confused on when they can then start things, and it's all based on the temperatures and the daylight hours. So, for example, with like broccolis and cauliflowers, I haven't even started those seeds yet because it's really, really hot right now and it probably will remain really hot for the rest of September. So I'll probably start those in October and grow them October, November, December, a little bit into January, maybe even start a second crop at that point. La Flama Blanca, La Flama Blanca. Why don't you say herbs properly? There's an H and it's not silent. I know you're just messing with me. Us Americans, we have weird sayings just like everyone else in the world, but <laughs> I don't know, to me, to say herbs sounds really weird because for us, herb is just someone's name. You know, I think herb, I think of like an old guy with glasses who like fixes people's shoes or something. Lisa Glebe, if you could live in any other state, which would you choose? I'm kind of tossing up between like Oregon and Washington right now. I'm actually looking for secondary properties up there. I'm just like keeping my eyes open. Not like I'm gonna make a move anytime soon, but I'm just keeping my eyes open. If there's like a cool cabiny wooded type of place, I would love, love, love to lock something like that down so I could have an anti-climate to my own climate and experiment with some different stuff. Little Schreiber, what are some of your favorite recipes to cook with your garden harvest or otherwise? Some of my favorite things in the past to cook have been uh, a salmon chowder recipe. It's like a paleo salmon chowder that I absolutely loved. I really got into making watercress soup for a while. I had never had it before. I had it at a restaurant and then I was like, okay, how do I make this? Watercress is actually one of the most nutrient dense greens you can eat, but the watercress soup probably a little less nutrient dense. It's watercress, potatoes, salt, and like uh, heavy cream, I think. And it's really, really good. So I would highly recommend trying out watercress soup. Watercress is trickier to grow than other plants because it really, as the name implies, wants constant, constant, constant moisture. But you can certainly try it. M. King, Kevin, so why do you not grow cannabis? It's a good herb, great for bees, etc. Uh, I actually have grown it in the past medicinally. I haven't grown it in years and years and years, but I might do it in the future, we'll see. Uh, I actually have some industrial hemp seeds, which is federally legal. I'd prefer to grow things that are federally legal, and so that's kind of what I'm focused on. Mariko Riley, what's my favorite food? Honestly, it's probably burritos, and I don't, I'm not proud about it. I wish it was like vegetables, but it's probably burritos. Metanoia, what is my favorite color? Um, green. Surprise, surprise. Pretty basic for a gardener, it's green. Uh, and it has been green since I was a kid. What motivated me to make an elaborate business out of it like this? Surely this is a lot of work and no small task. Yeah, I mean, my brain is sort of half and half in the garden and, and half in the business world. I like both a lot, actually. And for me, you know, I don't think I'm a very good employee. I'm certainly not very hireable from the perspective of, you know, most corporate jobs. And so, that goes for me. I don't like being told what to do. I don't like someone over me kind of bossing me around. Uh, and so I did whatever I could to make this work for me. Um, and you know, the business side of it's been really fun, you know, selling the birdies raised beds. It's been enjoyable. I love connecting with people and helping them grow. And so, you know, the art side, I guess you could say is all the videos and the content. And then the business side is kind of the back end that I really like. So for me, it's just having that freedom and getting to do exactly what I want to do, which I'm very particular about. And so that's just how I did it. Miriam Trujillo. Hi, Kevin. This is my first season gardening. I feel I've overcrowded my raised beds. How do you know when to stop planting? Um, generally speaking, uh, well, it depends on two things, right? So sometimes it's the roots you don't want to overcrowd and sometimes it's the foliage. Like if you're growing radishes, going anywhere more dense than 16 a square foot is just too much because the roots, which is what you're eating, are going to swell out and hit each other and they, they'll stunt their growth, right? And so every crop has its own recommended spacing density and you can get pretty close. I mean, you can get pretty dense. Like corn, you could go nine per square foot if you wanted to. I've found that unless you have a big bed of soil, it's not a good idea to go that dense. But yeah, I would recommend looking up the square foot gardening spacing planting. That helps you out a lot with that. Nathaniel Arch, what are your top 10 tips for potatoes? That's a lot of tips, my man. So I'm gonna give you three tips maybe. So one, I would say uh, hill them. Don't, don't hill them very much, if at all. Just bury the seed potato deeper and let it grow up. And in the interim distance, 
it's not the way to say it, but in the distance between the potato that you planted and the top of the soil, that's where all your potatoes will form. You could plant a potato 12 inches deep in theory and it works really well. So then you save labor by not hilling it out. I would say if you're growing them in a grow bag and you plant them low, right, because the soil's not hilled up yet, then you can roll the edges and let the sun come in and access it. And then when you have uh, new potatoes, you know you have new potatoes when you have those little flowers on your potato plant, that's when you can kind of dig up and grab some new potatoes. Nika Hat. Does my family also garden or do they ha all have their own sustainable living hobbies? Is there an epic garden mom? Yeah, there's an epic mom. She's been on my Instagram a lot. Uh, I got her into succulents and cacti maybe, I don't know, three or four years ago. And then she started gardening, gardening with edibles with a veggie pod uh, about, I would say last year sometime. So she has uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, so she can't really uh, get out and do a whole lot of physical labor without having to pay for it later. And so the veggie pods is a standing raised bed garden that she uses that she really, really likes. And so we're about to replant for fall on that one. Nico, what kind of things do you find joy in? What sparks happiness in you? I mean, I think just like the basics of human, human life. I like to learn. I like to learn how things work and figure them out. Um, I like to create stuff, make stuff, see people use it, um, being around family and friends, and just generally doing pleasurable human activities. That's pretty much what I enjoy. Paula Pham, can you make a living off of gardening? For sure you can. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to do it. The way I make a living off gardening is pretty unconventional compared to most, but you know, an edible garden coach, there's people who design and build raised bed gardens and install them and then maintain them for people. That's actually a pretty big business around the country. So that's something that you could do. You could become a market gardener, a market farmer. So you could farm either cut flowers, you could farm microgreens, you could farm in this land. I mean, in this land, I could, I could have a functioning market garden probably making five to $10,000 a month at minimum, I would say. Um, I just haven't done it, obviously. It's, it's a barren patch of weeds right now. But you know, I have friends who, who do market gardening. So there's a lot of different ways to make uh, a living off of gardening. Well, there's been a lot of questions. There's like 50 more that I haven't even gotten to. So I'll probably do another AMA if you guys like this. If you don't, then I won't do it again. That's how I, I roll. If you guys don't like it, I don't do it again. But the final question from The True, can you still do a nose manual? Let's find out. Okay, we're gonna start it out with a normal manual. Not the best, I'll be honest with you. Let's try the nose. Okay, I don't really have it anymore, but I'm probably gonna get into skateboarding because I might build a quarter pipe in the backyard. That's it for the AMA part one. Let me know what you guys thought about this. If it was super boring, then I really don't wanna do it again. But uh, if you want me to do it again, I will. So until next time, good luck in the garden, keep on growing and keep on skating. <laughs>